You're listening to the Write Project Podcast and Radio Program, a show about writing and modern Newfoundland author culture. This program is produced and recorded at CHMR FM 93.5 FM in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador, and is aired on other great stations in the province and elsewhere in the country. It can also be heard online at www.chmr.ca. I'm your host, Matthew LeDrew. Welcome to a very special episode of the Write Project Podcast. Today, we've got a host of authors on to answer one of the most frequent questions that's asked of any author. We're asking them, what was an early experience where you learned that language had power? And today to answer, we have on Colleen Helm from Utah. She is the writer of the Shelby Nichols Adventures series. Um, Colleen Helm, what was an early experience you had where you learned that language has power? Um, one day I, our whole class was asked to write a little message to our mothers on Mother's Day. And so I wrote this message and out of all the class, they picked out my, my little quote and they read it to the whole school and said that, and I thought, wow, I must have said that really good. <laughs> and it did make an, inf- an impact on me that, you know, words are important and, and how you say them and, and everything, it, it does have, con- they do have consequences. And um, I think I was about 10 or 11 when that happened, so. Thank you very much. Next up we have Teresita Jadora. Uh, Teresita, was there ever an early experience where you learned that language had power? Yes. Um, My school was very big on public speaking. And every year we had to do some piece for a public speaking competition that the school held. And... um, That sounds like torture. It was to some extent because I don't like public speaking (laughs) a whole lot in the sense of uh, standing up with a pre-prepared speech and just reading it off and then making it sound like I've just coming up with this on the top of my head. I'll either come up with it on the top of my head or I'll sound like I'm reading it. There's no in between. Yeah. Um, And there's no way I was memorizing like 500 word essay. So for me doing the public speaking made me kind of realize that what I wrote, because we were talking about real events, we were talking about climate change or, well, back then it was acid rain um, or, you know, some political thing at the time or, you know, something with um, real life consequences um, that if you were trying to argue your point, your words had to really, it was your entire game. And if you didn't bring your entire game, um, then you had nothing. And it was all in the words that you spoke or the words that you wrote that you had to do this. This wasn't just like get up and say your speech. You had two points of view. So I took pro and someone else took con. And we had to kind of debate uh, after we did our speeches. So every word we used had to be powerful. Yeah, that makes sense. Makes a lot of sense, actually. All right. Thank you very much. We have on the line J.E. Solo. Uh, J.E. Solo, what is an early experience you had where you learned that language has power? Hmm. Think on that for a minute. Well, hmm. Certainly, um, I'm a singer. Um, and my first lyrics, uh, I think the first song that I ever wrote that I performed was called, I believe I am the goddess. (laughs) And, um, it's extremely simple. And this is again, something that, uh, and I was very surprised by the sort of impact that it had, um, being so simple. And this is, again, a very early lesson that I learned, or maybe didn't learn, but recognize now. Uh, But but I definitely know it in songwriting. It's just been harder to transition it to 
prose and story storytelling um, about the simplicity um, of the words, but the way that they were arranged, you know, it had a big impact. So that's one experience that I can think of. Sure. I don't know. I could go off on a crazy tangent now about cymatics. Um, Please do. Cymatics is a, a term coined by a, a very, um, what's the word, curious guy named Hans Jenny way, way back. Uh, I can't remember when. You're making this up because your last name's Solo and that guy's last name is Hans. <laughs> no, not related, although you never know. You never know. All right. And somehow, sometimes it seems like we're all related. Anyway, it's some. It's very interesting. It's something I learned uh, very young as well. So it's sort of another answer to the question. But um, he did a lot of work with sound, where he would take, you know, things like pure sine waves, and he created a device where he put a plate on top of a speaker, and then filled the plate with different things like sand or water. Um, and different sounds will create different patterns in sa in sand, in water, in other malleable substances. And, you know, each sine wave has a totally different, um, what's the word, construction that it will create. Um, so sound has an impact on physical matter. Okay. Which cool. we already know by if we look at, you know, um, how some sound can travel through objects and some cannot. Um, uh, anyway, so Hans Jenny, Cymatics with a C. I uh, just suggest people look that up because it's really freaky stuff and you can recreate the experiments yourself. Um, using different sounds to see what kind of patterns those sounds make when they are interfaced basically with physical matter. Okay. That, anyway, that's a tangent. I warned you. <laughs> that is a tangent that I enjoyed and it's not one we had before. So I automatically liked it. Cool. Um, Thank you very much. Next on the line, we have author Shannon Green. Shannon Green is a gifted author with a talent for the strange and has been recognized in both the genre community and the contemporary literary community for his pursuits. In the past, he has been shortlisted for the 1996 Arts and Letters Award and has, has well won the 2015 Audience Choice Steampunk Newfoundland Showcase. Green has received praise for his stories The Wine Dark Sea in Chillers from the Rock as well as his stories in Fantasy from the Rock, Dystopia from the Rock, the Hamthology, and the just-released Flights from the Rock. Thank you for joining us, Shannon. Sh Shannon, uh, was there ever an early experience where you learned that language had power? I grew up in Newfoundland. I think I've always known that. That's fair. Um, fair. My grandfathers were both involved in politics to a greater or lesser extent, so I've seen just the ability to win people over with oration and through well-written pieces and us growing up in Newfoundland, we've always played with words. I grew up in a small town where the, the guy on the wharf would be extolling just massive pieces of wisdom and quoting Shakespeare, even though he dropped out of school in grade five to go fishing. Mm. It's, um, it, it's in the air here yep. when you listen to people and it's hard not to pick up on what you can do with words when you live somewhere that people honestly enjoy language and play with it to the extent we do here. Thank you very much. Next on the line, we have Heather Riley. What's an early experience where you learned that language had power? Oh, how early? Uh, after the womb, preferably. Well, for me, I had a great thing happen in college. <laughs> um, I went to college before I went to university. And in college, you had to do 
an English aptitude test to figure out what class to put you in. And there was an essay and a grammatical and a third portion. I can't remember what it was, but it was all. So I went down and did the tests and I scored 100%, 98, 96. And they're like, you don't have to take English. Yeah. So that for me was huge. And it was all because of my grandmother. When I was a kid, if we said anything grammatically incorrect or anything, she would stop you in your tracks and make you say it the right oh, that's way. That's why you're one of those people. It is. And it saved me. And I love it. And it's part of what made me such a good editor. I see. I see. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thank you very much. Next on the line, we have Kayla Krantz, who's calling in from Detroit. Uh, she's originally from Houston. She writes the Rituals of the Night series. Kayla Krantz, uh, what's an early experience that you had where you learned that language had power? I'd have to say pretty early on. Like I think the first time I ever read the notes from my editor and saw just the way that her moving a word or two changed the whole impact of a sentence really kind of stuck with me because it made me realize that every word matters. Absolutely. Sometimes just one word at a place can just drastically change stuff. No, that makes that makes perfect sense. That's a good example. Thank you very much. Next on the line, we have Matthew Daniels, frequent contributor to the From the Rock series, as well as the author of the upcoming novel, Diary of Knives. Uh, Matthew Daniels, what was an early experience in your life or development where you learned that language had power? Oh, wow. Um, see, over the years, I've taken a big interest in language-related activism. Oh, really? Uh, okay. So, yeah, so I have a great deal of appreciation for what language can and cannot do and how it can be weaponized, uh, like what we've seen in uh, genocide and various pers uh, cultural persecutions over the years. Uh, languages have been snuffed out by uh, colonial practices and that sort of thing. And we lose a great deal when that happens. Obviously, the culture itself and that particular group, indigenous peoples and so on, who have been, who've had their languages squeezed out uh, through reservation schools and this sort of thing. That's a big issue. Uh, and I've, and I've looked into that kind of stuff for a while. The earliest stuff was, uh, I guess, just general life experience. Like, I, I lived in the Labrador West on the border with Quebec. And, uh, and so growing up, um, I often saw a lot of conflict between Francophone and Anglophone communities and, and people uh, that I just felt wasn't necessary because they're being treated as though they're doing something wrong. And I'm like, this person has an entire language that you don't. They're the one who's got more going on than you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what? Don't say things like, excuse my French. That implies that, that French is profanity. French is a beautiful language. It is. Right? And these things bother me. Um, so I took a little bit more of an interest in that over time, and I looked into... Uh, like what's out there and I've found some interesting things um, for example there's a group uh, called the Tuva in Mongolia they're a nomadic crowd who follow the Ak around and their language builds in the landscape of their entire traditional domain so that you follow the, the Ak around according to how much of the grass or whatever has been growing for them and then you keep moving as they've you know had their fill in this area and their traditional lands are so wide that if you were born in one spot um you might not get back to it until you're a senior oh wow so their language got around this by basically building the map of intricate river systems of their entire landscape into how they phrase concepts of direction Interesting. So, That's so interesting. Right? And so when we talk about direction, we get into simple things. The compass rose, uh, a few references of distance, and that's about Our, Ours it. is so simple, we don't even have a z-axis. It's just right. north, east, west, south. Or, yeah, it, can't, it cannot be simpler. Yeah, and that has limitations. So this group... Like a z-axis. <laughs> 
Uh, so, like, they have an elaborate framework of using saying things that kind of roughly translate as like upper river, something like river riverways and sideways, and like all this kind of stuff. And it sounds really bizarre when you try to put it into into English, obviously, because it's a different language. Yeah. <laughs> so the framework doesn't necessarily parse all that well for us, but when you have that framework in their language you can't get lost well that's and, like i've had a hard time learning other languages i've i've found it darn near impossible my brain's just not wired that way uh i find but like one of and one of the problems is like tenses in other languages and and with english at least in speech like in writing but it's different but in speech we tend to have you know three past present future um uh, but other languages, even in speech, have dozens. Yeah, and it's really hard to get your your brain across sometimes, or at least for mine. Yeah, yeah. And this is one of the big benefits of language is that it offers a different way to think. It offers a different perspective. And when you have that kind of perspective, like imagine if you could get one of these Tuva peoples educated with uh, a science based system, um, and start looking at space exploration. Yeah. These people will have concepts for navigation that are way beyond what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And that's super handy. And there's another, another example I'd like to use is a group in uh, a mountainous re region around Mexico uh, where they have more elaborate concepts of like north and they bring in topography a lot more because they live in a mountainous region. And part of their language requires that you know where north is to the point that you can bring them underground twist them around have them spend the night and everything else and they will always know where north is it's just so ingrained yeah that's incredible they, just, they had to know because if you could somehow take that away from them they wouldn't be able to speak properly because of how their language is structured which is fascinating that is fascinating fascinating right okay. and look at our, all the and these and right and most of these groups who have these really interesting language aspects because every language has something to offer that way even the languages we're familiar with the european ones german and french and italian and so on that most people take for granted as just kind of your common other languages that doesn't mean they have nothing to offer no german has a lot to offer thinking about things differently right um and it's just when you have all those different perspectives, you when you're able to talk to people and who have these other languages, or you have these languages yourself, and you're familiar with different baseline assumptions, it allows you to overcome a lot of conflicts because you now know where they're coming from, what they meant when they said a certain thing, or what connections, assumptions, beliefs, and whatnot are underlying their actions, their decisions, their social framework. Um, you can overcome a lot of fear, a lot of anger, a lot of conflict in various ways by recognizing how powerful it is to reach across to somebody through how they build their words. Yeah. Yeah, you can. That's amazing. Great. Yep. <laughs> cool. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Alicia Morrissey. Uh, Alicia Morrissey, what was an early experience in your life where you learned that language had power? Wow. I know, that's that a, one's heavy, right? That's, that's a big one. Uh... Oh my God! Can we come back to that one? We can. Um, All right. Let's see. Market in red. Um. Thank you very much. Next on the line we have J R H Lawless, author of the novel Always Greener. Uh, this is an interesting one for you, given the subject of your your book and the uh, the uh, entomolo entomology. Is that the right word? Uh, entomology is something else. Uh, uh, Reed Chapman is invasive for entomology. That's ants. Uh, no, no, etymology. Entomology. Etymology. Entomology. Thank you. I'm gonna. E I'm gonna avoid the word because I won't pronounce it correctly. E T Y. E T Y. Etymology. 
etymology. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is an interesting question for you, given uh, how much your book, uh, Always Greener, focuses on etymology. Um, yes. But, uh, yeah, you know, what, Jay, what was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Um, that's that's a great question. Uh, and I'm not saying that because I don't have an answer. Um, I spent years being formatted within the French uh, Sciences Po system. So uh, France has um, public universities, but then it also has these sort of elitist uh, selective branches, uh, particularly in the sort of epitome of that is the Sciences Po political sciences institute system, uh, where there's, they're all over France, and I did the one in Bordeaux, and I did the one in Paris as well afterwards. And um, the key to everything you do there, you study everything, but the key sort of um, reading uh, that you have there and the way you're formatted is to take any question, uh, be it philosophical, uh, linguistic, historical, economical, uh, legal, anything, and break it down to, uh, you know, so you could do a five-hour dissertation on speed, and so you'll take the word and you'll do sort of brainstorming and you'll get all the associations and the etymology and the word origin and everything that goes with it. And then you have to build it into this two-part structure, uh, yes, but, no, but, uh, with two subparts and two sub-subparts and each subpart. You know, it's, it's, it's crazy. Any question has to boil down to the exact same structure. And that goes through studying. So <laughs> what I do in... Um, in always greener with the etymology is sort of you know like the 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 smallest level of that, but the level that I find most interesting, which is when you actually go into the meaning of the word, and it's really funny in that it has innuendo, in that it has a uh, completely different meaning from the one that we use, which reveals uh, usually something quite funny about you know the word itself and and what it means today. So yeah, that's that's why I, I like doing that. Excellent. Excellent. Very good answer. Very nuanced. Alicia Morrissey, uh, what yeah. was an early experience where you learned that language had power? I don't know, but I was born with that understanding. Okay. I have written my entire life. It's been part of my experience, again, since I, since I knew what the alphabet was. And I think... Choosing the right words has always been a kind of passion of mine. There's this running joke throughout the movie, Hot Fuzz. Um, you don't call them, um, you, you, you don't call a car accident a car accident. You call it a, a traffic collision. You don't call it the police force. You call it um, uh, the, the police um I, I don't remember what the exact word was, but it, throughout the entire movie, there's this running joke, and it's something that I really learned in journalism in particular. You know, you have to be specific. The, the 67-year-old man died. You never say they passed on. You never say they, you know, you, you can't be nebulous with your language. It's really essential to use the right word to describe the emotion, to describe the character's physic physicality. It's really important to use the right word in the right context. And English is this incredible language that has so many facets that, and so, so many synonyms that we can really pick the right one to emote properly and to get people to connect with it. So I think... Yeah, I think I think I was born with that. I think it's innate in me. Language runs in in my blood and and holds up my bones. So it's 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 not something that I can define as a single experience. I feel like language has always been just a part of me. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. That's it's a bit, that's such a, an odd question. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Uh, There's nothing sticks out, right? Like, there was no one word that somebody said to me that, like, changed everything. Uh, for me, and it, it it shines a real light on why I write the way I write, but for me, yeah. it was the first time I cursed as a child, and I saw the reaction of people, and I was like, oh, okay, oh. words can do things. 
Oh yeah, you know that's that's funny. I remember, I remember that exact thing happening to me. Yeah, yeah. There there is a point where you're like, like like the adult who doesn't who can hear you that or that doesn't expect it and like goes aback like you've struck them and it's like oh yeah oh okay yeah, yeah but I mean the the use of words it's it's we all speak to one another every single day and we don't really think about it right i mean but the words that you choose can hurt somebody they can they can make them feel good about themselves the words that we choose are are so important and and sometimes just using the wrong word or an incorrect word can really change the entire context of a conversation yeah. so yeah i i there was never one moment when i was like this is this is the impact that words have on people yeah. I think I've always known that words words mean a lot. You choose your words carefully was was a mantra in our household growing up. Yeah, yeah, which is something I could still learn. I think, but uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you could spend some time working on that. Yeah, I could. Although, like, I, I sometimes make the argument, like people are like, like when people point it out to me, like, like when I answer too quick or something, like, are you sure? And I'll think about it for a second. I was like, no, that was right. Like sometimes I think, <laughs> sometimes I think I just think faster, or like not that I'm saying everyone else thinks slow, but you know what I mean. Like sometimes I think that I I'm do. just, you know. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And sometimes, like one word, you know, I'll I'll be in a meeting with a client and they'll. They'll say one word about their company, and I'm like, "That's the cornerstone of everything going forward. That's their their company's new name. That's that's where the website's gonna the website content's gonna go. That's the advertising campaign. That one word, you know? Yeah, it happens like that. And Absolutely. yeah, I think we're all a little guilty of speaking too soon and and not measuring ourselves. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Jen Windsor, what was an early experience that you had where you learned that language had power, that, that words could influence people and had power? The language had power. Um, I guess probably pretty young. I was always a pretty kind of rambunctious type of kid, and I was always... Um, performing something i always played instruments and wrote things and wrote songs and plays and just constantly entertaining and uh my idea of a good time when i was a kid was to be you know to fully produce some type of show whether it be me playing music or acting out something or doing a lip sync and i would charge my family to come watch <laughs> um, and th this is all true there's multiple embarrassing uh vhs tapes that exist of um this footage but uh and i mean my family always kind of got a kick out of me i'm a little bit of like the family clown so i think from a really young age i i understood that you know language and communication was something important and something that um could make people smile and entertain them and um you know even when i got older i i was into theater and and um and uh improv and and whatever i could be in into school too and uh so yeah i guess uh i'm really young just so you know and that's wonderful that's a great answer that's really cool and funny mm -hmm. and i can't picture that at all um, mm -hmm. one thing that would really cheer people up during self-isolation is if those VHS tapes found their way to YouTube. Oh my goodness. I will say that I did a, I think last year I posted a very quick, like 15 second clip of a lip sync that I was in when I was like 10, um, at the Avalon mall and I won that lip sync. So, you know, you're an award winning <laughs> author. I, well, I'm an award-winning lip syncer. Well, no, you're you're, uh, you're those, you can put a comma between them and it still counts. You're award-winning <laughs> and an author. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, there's so many embarrassing uh, videos of plays and uh, again, like shows I put off for my family. But I I did have a a very um, lustrous uh, karaoke. No, sorry, I, a lip syncing career for a bit there. Um, and I, and I will admit that I did win most of them. I did. Well then. 
Yeah. Well then, I had no idea. That is wonderful. All right. Well, thanks for coming on again. For all of you, we'll be here again next week at 4.30 Newfoundland time or online at chmr.ca. Please tune in and we'll talk more about writing culture in Newfoundland.